I said, the word is waiting on God. Look to your neighbor, say waiting on the Lord. On the Lord. That's it, yep. So the good place to always start when it comes with anything is always definitions. So first thing to note is in the Hebrew, the main word that's used is the word um, kavah, kavah. And what this translates to mean is to wait, to look for hope and to expect. When you go to the Greek, we have perimeno, where if you split up the word, peri means around. Mino means to stay, to wait, to stand firm. So in, in essence, that word means to wait around, to stay around. That's the position of someone that has an expectation in the Lord. Amen. So the concept of waiting in scripture is just seen throughout. When we first see the concept of waiting, you see in Genesis 6, where Noah's told that he has to wait for the Lord to send forth a flood. What happened was the sons of man, they were procreating with the, with the, I guess the sons of God really, and we ended up having this offspring of which the Lord detested. So the Lord said to Noah, in 120 years, he's going to send forth a flood. So imagine explaining to people that you're waiting for something you have never seen before. At that time, they'd never seen a flood. I don't think they'd even seen rain. And the Lord is saying, you have to wait for me to do this. And he does it. And the Lord keeps to his promise that he said to Noah. Then you see it again where with Abraham, he, God had promised him that his offspring will be held in captivity for 40, 400 years. And what you see is that 400 years comes and they're still having to wait upon the Lord to send forth a deliverer. And we know that this comes in the form of Moses. But can you imagine having to endure hardship, clinging on to something that you've heard? but not seeing it come forth. And even us as believers, we understand waiting. We're currently waiting for the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But imagine those before us that had to wait for a Messiah that was written about, that had to wait for a Messiah that was prophesied about. Can you imagine having to cling on to this? And even when he came, some of them still didn't believe this is the one that they were waiting for. We understand the concepts because we know he's coming back. But where am I going with this? It's just to show that the concept of waiting is seen throughout scripture. However, we're gonna focus on two aspects of waiting. So the first aspect is going to be waiting for a call of the Lord. The thing of a call of the Lord is that when you're waiting for it to come to manifestation, you're waiting for something that you never even chose. You're waiting for a responsibility that the Lord forced upon you. It's just, can you imagine, even if you don't want to, even if you want to run, would he not just swallow you like he did with Jonah? <laughs> like, so we're going to look into that concept. We're going to also look about waiting for our heart's desire. Imagine you're waiting for something that you've read the word, you know that it's promised to you, but you're not seeing it come to pass. So we'll look into that in regards to the call of God. We'll look at that concept, just going through the journey of King David and how he got to his kingship. In regards to the heart's desire, we'll look at Hannah and how she positioned herself. And once we get through all of that, what do you do when you're waiting? How do we position ourselves? We'll journey through that together. So with that being said, um, we're going to look at waiting, waiting on the Lord in regards to a calling. Amen? Amen? Awesome. So the first thing I want to note is that, I, like I said, when you're waiting for a calling, You've been placed in a position that you never, never chose. Some people even never wanted it even, to be, let's be honest. But the Lord has said, from the beginning of time, I've placed this inside of you. It's first seen, in fact, best seen in Jeremiah 1.5, where before the Lord even says to Jeremiah, I've called you to be a prophet, he says that I've placed, I, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. I ordained you. I called you to be a prophet to nations. And the thing with this is that, in regards to this call, it's bestowed upon him whether or not he wants it or he's asked for it. It's a mandate that the Lord has given to him. So whether or not he even does it, he will still be judged for what he did with it. So what happens where you know what the Lord has called you to and you're still waiting for it? Um, let's all turn to 1 Samuel 10 verse 8, where, as I said, we're going to go through the journey of David and how he became king. But to first understand that you have to actually look at King Saul and understand the challenges from that to how we get to David. So, um, awesome, yes. Okay, so the thing with King Saul, right, 
The Lord had chosen him to be king. Um, he did this via his prophet Samuel, where the problem was and why David actually became king was because Saul had disobeyed the Lord two times too many, right? So when the Lord ordained him as being king, it came with clear instructions, of which one of the instructions was that um, he was meant to wait for Samuel to meet him in a region called Gilgal. So, um, so yes, yeah, so, yes, we have, perfect, yes. So verse eight reads, and you shall go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down to you with burnt, and, with burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings. You shall wait seven days until I come to you and show you what you should do. So look, look to your neighbor and say, wait. wait, wait, seven days, right? So what happened was, whilst he was waiting for, whilst he was waiting for Samuel to come, Saul became quite scared. So at this time, the, is, the Israelites had defeated the Philistinian army. So word was going around about that. And the Philistinians, as you can imagine, they're not happy. They're like, how dare these people? So they're on a rampage at the moment. So as Saul has gone through all of the instructions that Samuel has given to him, he's becoming intimidated because the Philistinian people are essentially looking for the Israelites to attack them. Scripture says that some of them hid in caves, some of them hid behind bushes. They were just hiding anywhere, cisterns, everything. So in this moment, imagine, um, Saul was sitting there saying that the Lord has said, I must stay here for seven days so Samuel can come and do the offering. He's looking around him, he's getting scared. So instead of him to position himself and wait like the Lord had said, he decides to take it upon himself to do the offering that the Lord had said Samuel, that, that, yeah, the Lord had said that Samuel should do. And the problem with that is that he was not meant to do this. He was not meant to do this. And this was the first thing that actually costed him his kingship. So um, I'm just gonna see if I can find this. Yes, so if we go to, yeah, we've already read six to eight, perfect. So if we go to 1 Samuel 13, eight to 10, please. Perfect. So it reads, now he waited for seven days until the appointed time that Samuel had set, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered a burnt offering, but as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul came out to meet him and greet him. The thing that's so interesting about this, right? In that exact moment, on the same seventh day that he was meant to wait for, Saul to, for Samuel to come, as soon as he's finished doing the process by himself, that is the exact moment that Samuel is present. And what this shows is that if he had just waited a little bit longer, imagine just a couple of minutes, maybe, in that moment, God would have showed up for him. But because of his lack of patience and his disobedience, he took it upon himself to now do this offering and it costed him everything. And the thing that's so interesting about this as well, and the reason why it was so problematic that he did it, was that offerings could only be done by Levites and offerings could only be done by priests. He was neither any of those, he was a Benjaminite. So imagine the Lord's even got even more offense because it's like the audacity, <laughs> the audacity. So. What I want to know in regards to this is that if we only just wait a little while longer when the Lord gives us instructions, maybe just then, that thing that we're waiting for, the door may open for it to be ours. Amen. Amen. And the second thing to just note as well, actually, one more thing, in regards to him losing his kingship as well, it was from this moment onwards that Samuel prophesied to him um, yeah, Samuel prophesied, yeah, Samuel prophesied to him essentially saying that the Lord is going to send someone that's after my own heart. And in the next disobedi disobedient acts that we'll note, he, it actually ended up costing him his whole dynasty, his whole line. So if we go to 1 Samuel 15, 1 to 3, um, yeah, 1 to 3, what is seen essentially is that the second time that Saul disobe disobeyed Samuel, is that the Lord gave him very clear instructions to go to battle the, I, I can't say this word properly, Amalekites? 
Because what had happened was they had oppressed the Israelites in their time in Egypt. And the Lord is a God that he remembers the sufferings of his children. So this was the moment that he wanted to therefore get vengeance on behalf of his children. So the instructions are quite clear that you have to go to this region, destroy everything, destroy the children, destroy the men, destroy the offspring, destroy the flock, everything. However, when, when, when Saul decided to go there, he decided essentially to go keep the king, King Agag, and also keep the best of the, of, of the flock, the best of the flock, so the best of like the oxen, the goats, the lambs, everything. He decided to keep this because in his mind he thought, it will be great if I can now come and offer this to God. But God did not ask for this. And um, yes, if we go to 1 Samuel 15, 10 to 11, what you see here is that once he did this act, the Lord spoke to, 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 to Samuel and essentially said that I regret making him king. He says, I regret that I made Saul king because he's turned his back from following me and has not carried out my commands. Samuel was furious and it says that he cried out to the Lord all night. And the reason why this was actually worse than the first thing is that Saul tried to give Lord the best of the worst. So imagine, right? When I, was, when I was reading this, what the Lord showed me was, imagine a bag of fruit, right? The whole bag's expired. Every, everything is rotten. What he did was, he put his hand in this bag. He found the one which had the least amount of mold. He now blew it and said, God, here, have it. Can you imagine? And the reason why that's so interesting is because the Lord wanted him to do a particular task but he took it upon himself to think I can do something better, right? And the issue with doing this is that even though this is the best out of the worst, this will make you sick. This will make you sick. This can make you ill. This can even poison you. And the reason, the thing that's so interesting about that is that this is representative of doing good in your own strength. When you do good in your own strength, the actual translation, it says filthy rags are like, good deeds are like filthy rags unto God. The translation of the word filthy rag is a menstrual towel. It's a pad, it's a tampon. And that's essentially what he was trying to give unto the Lord. And the thing that's interesting about this is that it shows that if you try to do things based on what you think is good, understanding that God is the standard of good, if you still miss the instruction of him, it is offensive to him. That's the heart of someone that's not fully rooted in him. That's the heart of someone that is lukewarm. And what does scripture say about someone that's lukewarm? What will God do to you? I say it again. <laughs> exactly. In the same manner that if you're, if you're trying to consume a rotten fruit and you will vomit, it's the same manner that the Lord will also vomit you out. And that's essentially what he was trying to do. Amen. Amen. So when we get to 1 Samuel 15, 22 to 23, we see the manifestation of that of which the Lord had spoken to um, Samuel, where he said that he regretted and he's now rejected him from being king. So what we see here, it says that, and what happened was Sam Samuel had gone to try and correct Saul, where um, Saul's now trying to justify, yeah, but I gave the best flock and I gave this and I did that. And Samuel says to him, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And after this moment, the Lord doesn't act, not the Lord, sorry, Actually, yes, yeah. so the Lord and Samuel both decide to not, they don't speak to him again. Up until the point that they both die, he does not hear from Samuel again. And the point I wanted to speak about earlier, about him losing the kingship, it was as deep as this, right? If he had remained king, his, his children would have continued being king. And in the same manner that we see that Jesus is described as son of David, it could have been Jesus, son of Saul. It's, that is the depth that he lost. That is the depth, that, the depth that he lost in his disobedience to the Lord. In him, even in the first instruction, not waiting. So with that, we can see how lack of waiting, lack of impatience, 
um, or lack of patience rather, can cost you something very detrimental. So what happens next? The Lord's rejected him. I said, the Lord does not speak to him again. To the degree when he wants to speak to the Lord, he has to try and go to one medium, one witch doctor like that, right? <laughs> the Lord sends Samuel to his next task and he's like, Samuel, get up, stop grieving the loss of Saul. Israel needs a king. I'm going to send you where you need to go. So he ends up being sent to Bethlehem. Say Bethlehem, guys. Bethlehem, Bethlehem the same town that Christ was born, actually. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so he goes to Bethlehem and he's led to the house of Jesse, right? So Jesse has about eight sons in total. Some people say seven, but mainly eight. So as soon as Samuel gets there, the first son he sees, he, he sees him, he's, he's, he's hench, you know. He looks as if he's like, he's swallowed a few Philistines. He's like, that's, that, that's the one that has to be king. And the Lord's like, no, 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 it's not that one. Um, and then that's when the Lord goes forward to even be like, you see the outward appearance, but I see the heart. It's not, it's not that one. So he keeps sending forth all of his sons and God's like, no, not that one, not that one, not that one. Up until the point when Samuel has to ask Jesse, uh, are there any more, any more sons? And the one that he chooses is the one that's outside in the backyard. The one that they forgot about. The one that just minds his business and does, does, he just does that of which he's meant to do in the Lord. Hallelujah. So let's all move to 1 Samuel 16, 11 to 13, please. Okay. So it says, then Samuel said to Jesse, are these all the boys? And he said, he said, no, the youngest, the youngest is left, but behold, he's tending the sheep. So Samuel said to Jesse, send the word, send the word, sorry, and bring him for we will not take our place at the table until he comes here. So he sent the word and bought him. Now he was reddish with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him for this is he. So Samuel took the horn of the Lord and anointed yeah, so, so, so the horn of oil, sorry, and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Like we saw earlier, the Lord had promised Saul when he sinned that he would find someone that was after his own heart. And this was David. What's so fascinating about David, right, is that throughout the whole of scripture, with King Saul, the Lord never spoke to Saul directly, right? The only time he spoke to Saul directly was when he gave him the prophecy to give to somebody else. Everywhere else, the, every time Saul wanted to hear from the Lord, he would have to go via prophet Samuel. The Lord would never speak to him like that. However, with King David, multiple times throughout scripture, David's able to inquire directly of the Lord and the Lord would answer him. He did not have to go through other people and this shows someone that's after the Lord's heart. This shows someone that whilst they're waiting for that of which the Lord has called them for, they're still diligently seeking him. They're still diligently serving him. They still commune with him. And this is someone that he sees as his child, someone that he knows intimately. And this is the reason why he was chosen to be king, right? So the next thing for us to know is that David was anointed for his call before he actually had the title. He was anointed for his purpose before he had the platform to be able to do anything with it. And even with that, he went forward and he served the Lord diligently. Sometimes the Lord anoints us for things, but it's just not quite the time yet to be able to do anything public with it. David was anointed three times. The first time we just saw in his back garden with, with, um, back garden with, with Samuel. The second time was when he was, was anointed to be king of Judah. Not king of Israel like was promised, but the step before that. And it was only the third time when he finally was anointed and he went forward in his purpose. What I'm trying to say to you here is that sometimes the Lord will anoint you for something, but it's not to stop you serving him. It's not to stop you doing things and functioning for him. Sometimes all of this is part of the training and the journey to get to the end goal. And what happens is sometimes we can become discouraged and disheartened when Okay, the Lord's called me to be a prophet. The Lord's called me to be an evangelist, but you're not seeing everything yet. But the Lord still wants you to serve in that. And as you serve in that, more things may continue to open up. As David started serving the Lord, regardless of the platform, regardless of anything, 
It says that as soon as he was anointed, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and every little detail of his life spoke and testified of the Lord's hand upon him up until the point that he finally became king. If we took the things that we're waiting for in regards to God and it, it, with our walk with our call like that, maybe just maybe the wait may be a little bit shorter. Amen. So the next thing I want to talk about is that, um, da, 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 sorry, I've lost myself in my notes. Um, if David had decided to be prematurely do that of which the Lord had served him for, he may have actually died an early death in his walk with the Lord. And one of the things I really want to touch on is that, like I said, the Lord would anoint you for something, but it might not be the time to fully manifest every aspect of it. And the reason for this is because prematurity would cause death in that of which the Lord has called you to. So there's a reason why things take a process. The best way to understand this actually is with childbirth. A woman is meant to be pregnant for 40 weeks. Anything before that, you can get away with maybe 36, fine. But let's say she gives birth around 24 weeks. This baby's not ready to go home yet. This baby ends up in intensive care. This baby ends up incubated. And the reason for that is because every organ is not fully aligned yet. That's very similar to us. If we go out prematurely, every single detail of, of our call has not come into alignment with each other yet. And that means when we go out, we end up dying an early death, not able to fully, so we cripple ourselves. What happens is as well is that when this child is in an incubator, most of the times their lungs are attached to help them breathe. If we go out prematurely, we can suffocate our core. So it's very important to wait for the, for, for, for the whole development to come to fruition before we get sent out. So even moving forward in this, um, the spirit of the Lord left Saul, right? And from this moment forward, it says that he was troubled in spirit. He, he became fearful, he, he became depressed. And he, he then requested that the Lord would send somebody that can play the harp in order to calm down his spirits. The person that gets sent is King David. Well, David at this time, he's not, he's not, he's not king yet. And even though he was waiting on the Lord, he still served in every other capacity that, he, that the Lord had put inside of him. So David gets sent to the palace, right? And imagine, the Lord's already said to him that he's meant to be king, but he's been sent to this palace in the form of a harpist. Imagine if he was arrogant. He would say, me, a whole me. <laughs> a whole me that's meant to be king. You want me to go and sit on the, this one that's even going to go soon? No, not me. <laughs> but he went there and he played the harp to the point that um, it actually goes on to say that... Um, David was quite, not David, sorry, Saul was quite happy with him. Um, let me find the exact word. So it says here that, um, so if we go to 1 Samuel 16, 21, it says David went to Saul and began serving him. And Saul loved David very much. And David became his armor bearer. So in him serving the Lord, not, not essentially in what the Lord had said the full picture was, but in the other giftings that he had, it made, root, it made room for him and it actually positioned him in the same place that he would be called to later on, right? And what I'm trying to say is that, again, one of the things I didn't, well, I didn't say earlier is that when the Lord called, called David to kingship, he was about 15 years old. This did not come to fruition until about the age of 30. So all of this is the journey of 15 years to getting there. In this, he still chose to not give up on the other things that the Lord had given to him. He didn't just fixate on the one thing, which was kingship, but every other aspect he was still serving in, knowing that it's part of the bigger picture. And imagine if he just decided to be puffed up and be like, I'm just going to wait for just this one gift. He could have lost the other ones. This is almost like the parable of the talents. Imagine if you just focus on the one and you bury the other ones. Will the Lord not still ask you, what about those ones too? Like, and you, what, what, what will you say to God? I just focused on this one that I thought was the most important. It doesn't work like that. We still have to continue serving the Lord and all the other things that we have. So, as David waits for the call, I said the anointing of the Lord was really loud on his life. At this point, it couldn't be hidden. So small David, small David is probably, what, 15 years old, decides to go and tell Saul that he wants to come and fight Goliath. 
This same Goliath that everyone else that's older than him, than him is even running away from. But the difference with him is that he went forward to do that, understanding his relationship with God. Um, if we go to 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 37, I'm just going to read 36, 35 to 36, actually. Um, and this is David speaking to Saul, where he's trying to justify why it's okay for him to go and fight this giant. And just to mention, like, Goliath's huge. Like, he's like nine foot six. So you have this 15-year-old boy that's probably here trying to fight one big somebody like that. But <laughs> he's speaking in regards to when he's in, when he's in the fields, how he goes after, um, if a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, he says, I go after it with a club and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turn, turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. And this is 36, the part that's key. He says, I've done this to both lions and bears and I shall do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord said that he was going to send somebody that was after his own heart. And in every aspect of David's journey, the focus was always on God. It was always focused, he was always focused on the honor of God. He was always focused on the reputation of God. He was always focused on ensuring that I have to do this so the Lord would not be made seen as a liar. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone else was all, they were all moving in fear, like, ah, I will die if I try and fight this beast, but not him. So we're seeing again upon this journey of waiting, his development in his relationship with God. And as I said, it shows intentionality and it shows someone that actually knows the Lord. He's experienced the Lord. And that's why he can depend upon him, upon every aspect of his weight. So um, one of the things I wanted to know is that once he finally killed Goliath, the blessing did not only impact him, but it impacted his family. So one of the things that happened, well, one of the things that was promised to the person that could kill Goliath was that the family, whoever will be the dad, whoever's in charge in the household would not have to pay taxes anymore. He was given riches. He was even given the daughter of um, Saul, of which Saul tried to use to kill him, but that's another story. But, <laughs> but um, with, with all of this fame, which came from, again, his obedience to the Lord, it ended up causing enemies. And the enemy that he had was King Saul. So the start of this actually happens when he's, he's, he's defeated Goliath and the women are now singing to Saul saying, ah, Saul has killed 1,000, but David 10,000. And from this moment onwards, his heart, his, his heart starts to harden towards David. He's now at that point of anger. This person that it said earlier that he loved, that used to play the harp for him, now mm, this, this is number one enemy. This one, I have to kill him, right? So the same David that was able to play the harp before him and calm his spirit, Saul is now lunging spears at him. Do you know what? Throughout scripture, right? He tries to kill him 11 times, 11 times. And the reason why that's so interesting is because all that he was offended by was the call that the Lord put upon him. That's the only thing that was really choking his heart. <laughs> the fact that this one, this small boy, look at this small boy, he's gone and done this, he's done this, the people like him. And all of this was because of his disobedience when he was meant to wait upon the Lord himself. He's upset because someone did that thing that he could not do. And he's now offended by it because he's seeing the fruit of it. He's seeing the fruit of it. Because the thing is, right, when you serve the Lord diligently, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? And how many things are added onto you? Oh. Oh, is it one? Oh. <laughs> is it two? Oh. No, it's everything. And this was reflective upon David's life where he now had riches. His family was now okay. And the Lord's glory was so evident upon him. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you just only wait upon the journey of the Lord and continue to serve him diligently, everything will come together and work for your good. Amen. Everything will come together and work for your good. Amen. Amen. So one of the things I want to speak about, right, is that um, upon the hardship that David went through, he still maintained his trust in the Lord. 
where he wrote loads of psalms. He wrote loads of songs. One of the ones I want us to look at is actually Psalms 27. And I actually want us to read it, actually, from verse 1 to 3. Can we have it in the NLT version, please, if that's okay? Thank you. So... Awesome. So, like I said, he this he's really like he's really going through it at this point. <laughs> Saul has tried to kill him eleven times. He's really sitting here waiting for this kingship that was promised upon him. And in this he had an unshaken trust in the Lord. So this is one of the Psalms that he wrote upon everything that was going around him. So let's just read it together, then we'll go through it. Ready? Go one, two, three. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Amen. When my mighty arms around me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I'm attacked, I will remain confident. Amen. How many of you, how many of you, let's be honest, when you're going through it, when the tax are hitting you and you're now just doing this, <laughs> how many of you are able to, thank you, how many of you are able to say that your confidence remains still steadfast in the Lord? How many of you will confidently say, imagine, you're waiting for a job. Every single job is rejecting you. You're not even getting to interview. How many of you will say, yes, God is still good? <laughs> How many of you will not for a minute just be like, is, <laughs> what's going on? What I want to say is, and let this just be, if there's anything you take, when you're going through it, just remember that. Remember that your confidence should still remain in the steadfast love of the Lord. Because if you continue to just fixate your gaze upon him, despite all that's going on, doors will open for you. Amen. So... Right. Like I said earlier, it takes about 15 years for David to actually re reach the aspect of his call that the Lord had said to him. But before he could actually reach his full kingship, the Lord first gave him, you can almost say a playing ground, where he became king of Judah. Not the full fulfillment of that of which he'd called him to, but partial. And the reason why the Lord does this, for some of us, the Lord may say you're called to something, but he has to first give you a stepping stone just to see how you handle the responsibility. And if you pass this stage, then, just then, you can actually get to the fullness of what he's called you to. So he served as king of Judah for about seven years. And even with that, even though he, was, he knew he was called to be king of Israel, everyone knew he was, he was meant to be called king of Israel, he still had to fight his way with one of King Saul's, to get, king, king Saul's children to get there. And... The reason I say that is because sometimes you can actually see someone that's not meant to be, in, in, that's, not, that's in the place of where you're meant to be. And you still have to remain fixated on that of which the Lord has said. Because if the Lord said it, it has to come to pass. So even despite what was going on, he had to actually fight Saul's son. And it was only when he was, when he was killed, it was in this moment he could finally enter the destiny of which the Lord had called him into. So what I'm trying to say here is that sometimes you're nearly at the end of the finish line. You can literally see it. Something, someone may now come and sit in that place, but you still have to believe what the Lord has said. Because if he has said it, it has to happen. Let it be a thing where even if it looks like it's not going to happen and things look impossible, just remember that the Lord said it and he cannot lie. He is not man that he lies. So if he has said this, it has to happen. So King David, or David, becomes king only just, what, in 2 Samuel 5, 3 to 4. We've journeyed from 1 Samuel 15. That's a long time. A whole 15 years, he finally steps into the kingship that the Lord had purposed him to. So um, if we turn to 2 Samuel, sorry, 5, 3... Um, it says, so the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them before the Lord in Hebron. Then they anointed David king over Israel. David was 40 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. 
There was a reason why the journey was so long. And it's because the reign that he had was so long. Because there was so much expected out of his call, the training had to be longer. And sometimes that's why if the Lord has said you have to be something or do something, maybe he's given you an idea or maybe he said you're called to X, Y, Z. The journey may have to be longer because more will be required of you when you actually step into that place. More, there's, there's more responsibility and there's more weight upon your call. Therefore, he can't just be like, okay, here, one year of training, go. No, you may need 10 years because there's 10 years worth of lives that, that are waiting for this moment. There may be, there may be someone that they, they may, they, for you to be able to even be used as a vessel, a little bit more work is needed for you to be able to be the one the Lord sends to actually allow him to move in their heart. So in regards to the call, and I'm just summarizing the call before we go to our heart's desire, sometimes the journey is going to be long and hard, but it will be worth it. It will be worth it. And as said earlier, whether or not you wait upon the Lord for this, you will still be held liable for what you do with that of which the Lord has called you for. So it's better to just place yourself and wait, uh, wait for the timing of the Lord to be able to go forward and deliver that of which he's put inside of you. Amen. So I said earlier, what, what happens when you're waiting on the Lord for your heart's desire? We spoke about you're now waiting for something that you didn't even ask for. What about that thing, that one thing that you really want? That one thing of which you've read the word and you know that this is something promised to you because you are his child. The best place to see this is 1 Samuel 1, where you have the story of Elkanah and he has two wives. One of the wives is called Peninnah, the second one is Hannah. And what scripture tells us in um, 1 Samuel 1 verse 2 is that Peninnah has children but Hannah has none. And the reason why this is so interesting, right, it's because in the culture at that time with Israel, barrenness was seen as a curse. For someone to be barren and not fruitful, and it's not even just having children, if you didn't have any flock, if you had no crop, if you were someone that you were, po that you, you were poor, it would be seen as if the Lord's hand was removed from you. Um, when we go to scriptures like, and I want us to turn to Deuteronomy 28, 9 to 12. Um, I'm just going to read it as well. This is the Lord speaking to the Israel, speaking to Israel, his people. And it says, the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, as he swore to you. But if you keep the commands of the Lord, Lord your God and walk in his ways, so all the people of the earth will see that you were called by the name of the Lord and they will be afraid of you. And the Lord will give you more than enough prosperity in childbirth of your of, sorry, in children of your womb, in offspring of your flock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to you, to your fathers to give to you. So as you see here, as evidence of the Lord's glory upon his children, you, there was an expectation of, 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 of more. There was an expectation of offspring, an expectation of wealth, an expectation of having produce. So if you were someone that you were now barren, it was, it was almost as if, what's going on? Are you not a child of the Lord? Right? If you go through, um, there's something which is known as, um, I just want to get the word correct. It's called the Midrash, right? The Midrash is, is a collection of Jewish writings of which has been judged by scholars. And when you go through these writings, what is seen is that, and I found this quite interesting, actually. There were stories of women that would go before a judge asking for their husbands to divorce them because they were unable to produce children after 10 years of marriage. And this was because they didn't want to be seen as a disgrace unto their husbands. Because the problem was, was that in this society, as a woman, your security in your home was based on the ability to produce children. So if you were now someone that you, you did not have any offspring, they didn't want to bear the shame of being the cause of why their husbands do not have their name, the legacy of their name carried forth. So this issue of Hannah was a very big deal. It was a very big deal. And the thing with her barrenness is that it actually costed her, even her sanity in her home. So if we go to 1 Samuel 1, 4 to 5, I'm going to read two versions actually. And what I want to talk about is that even though Hannah, it says that 
Elkanah loved her. The fact that she could not conceive, actually, it, it became a form of punishment to her. So in the, which version is this one? Okay, perfect, yeah. So in the NASB version, it says, when the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah, he would give a double portion because he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. If you translate this directly from the Hebrew, it translates to, but unto Hannah, he gave a worthy portion for Hannah he loved, but the Lord had, the Lord had shut her womb. The word that's used for worthy is the word ap. Say ap. And the thing of this word, right, it's only translated to mean worthy one time in scripture. The, the, the majority of the times it's used, which is about 172 times, it's translated to mean angry. Angry. So the best way to actually understand this word is that in Genesis 30, when Rachel was now accusing Jacob of being the cause of her barrenness, it says that he angrily responded to her, am I in place of God that I have shut your womb? This is the exact same word that's used in, in, in this scenario. So what, what I believe from this is that it shows that he wasn't happy that she couldn't have children. And therefore he was now putting an added pressure on her. It says later on in scripture that Penina also was mocking and taunting her for the fact that she could not have children. Imagine having to do with the weight of your husband and also his other wife taunting you and not happy with you because you're not able to deliver something that you want. And it's also by a cause that's not even your own fault. The Lord is the one that had closed her womb. It's not because she had done anything. It's not because she had a generational curse. It was because the Lord decided to shut her womb because it was not yet time for that of which was our heart's desire to be buffed. So imagine the hardship, and I'm sure many of you can relate that you have something that you really want, and it's now to the point that it's actually impacting people around you, but it's not your fault that you have to wait. You have to wait because the Lord has not said that it's, it's, it's time for this to be granted to you. And let this be a sign to be that if you just rest in him, a time will come when that of which you've asked for, that of which you desire for, that it will come into alignment with his will for it to happen now. And that's what we see with Hannah as we continue through the text. So it says later on that Hannah goes to the temple. So if we go to 1 Samuel 1.11, it says that Hannah goes to the temple and she now decides to make a vow which changes everything. And it says that um, she made a vow and said, the Lord of armies, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your bondservant and remember me and not forget your bondservant, but will give your bondservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never, sorry, never come on his head. And it says that she prayed this deep within her spirit to the point of which it says that her mouth was not even moving. No sound came out of her mouth. And what this looks like is Romans 8, 26 to 28, which speaks of when the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And the thing with that, right, that point of intercession is when the Holy Spirit is praying from inside of your belly the will of the Father over you. And the word for this is actually travail. Travail is when you're now pushing through something you're pushing through a hardship because the Holy Spirit is the one that's empowering you to even continue praying. And the thing with travail is that once you push through out of travail, that's the moment that the heavens open for your sake because the Lord's will is now that of which is coming to pass over you concerning this matter. And that's what we're seeing with Hannah. In this moment where she went to, she went to, the, temp, to the tabernacle Tabernacle in Shiloh. And the thing that's key about this as well, this tabernacle is where the Ark of the Covenant was. You see our brother Lawrence earlier that spoke of the same Ark that he put his prayer request and the Lord granted. That Ark was in that tabernacle that day that she went to pray. And I believe this is the reason why that alongside her pouring her soul out to the Lord, pouring out every despair that she had and allowing the Holy Spirit to travail through her this is the reason why the Lord granted her petition. 
she went that step further to make a vow to God that if you just give me this one thing, this one thing, my heart's desire, I will give it back to you. And the thing with Hannah is that she honored her word when she said that, right? Many of us, we can go to the Lord and we can pray. If you give me this one thing, I, I, will, I will dedicate it to you. I'll do this event. The thing comes and you forget. The thing comes and it now becomes the most important thing. You've now received the end goal, so why does it matter to come back and, and praise God for it? She didn't do that. Once Hannah received this child that she prayed for, she asked for a son and the Lord gave her a son. She named the child Samuel, where Samuel means that um, this is the child of which the Lord has given to me, right? And the thing that's key is that she honored her vow, right? Where she said that, when, once she has this son, he will, be in the, he will be serving the Lord all the days of his life. Samuel, Samuel does not enter the temple. In fact, Hannah as well does not enter the temple until he's of an age that she can now leave him to now live there and serve from that moment forward. And she doesn't just go there with, with, with just Samuel. She even goes the step further to even bring him with an offering. It wasn't even that, oh, okay, I only said I'm going to give just, just the boy. She goes and she gives even more in order to be that of which would seal that of which she said to the Lord. So what I'm trying to say here is that sometimes our heart's desire can be something of which can, it's even that of which is crippling us because it's not coming to pass. But just only if we could just focus our gaze on the Lord and even remember the promise that we said, if the Lord gives it to us, I will do X, Y, Z, then the Lord will maintain that promise. Then the Lord would honor it as well. So I feel like many of us will pray about it later. We may have maybe uttered those words and not quite honored it. It may be something we need to pray about just to ensure that the Lord's hand just remains upon it. Amen. 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 The last thing, oh, I'm running out of time. <laughs> the last thing I want to talk about is, I said, what do you do while you're waiting? Like we've seen, waiting can be really hard. Sometimes you get put in situations where you're like, this is long, let me take it into my own hands. But for those of us that are still waiting upon something, whether it be your call, whether it be a promise, there's some steps that we can take that make it that little bit easier. The first thing is self-reflection, right? In the time of waiting, sometimes it's that we just have to ask the Lord, what is it in me that needs to change for me to have this of which you want me to do? For some of us, it can be our character that's actually blocking this breakthrough. Others, it can actually be you're not mature enough for it. So if the Lord gives it to you, you can't, it, it, it's, it's not going to be of value to him. So it's, I'm not going to give this to you yet. For others, it can actually just be that the Lord's trying to teach you patience and being able to trust in him and being able to understand who he is. Maybe he wants you to have a, a greater revelation of himself. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about for me, right? Um, I said to my husband this earlier, where back when I was in uni, right? All of my friends had somebody and I was that one person that was just like, what is it? Am I ugly? Is this the problem? <laughs> so I remember praying about it and I was like, Lord, what's going on? Why does no one, why is no one, I'm not even attracting people, what's going on? <clears throat> if I tell you what God said, yeah. <laughs> God literally said, and I kid you not, I remember it was a Sunday in my old church, right? God said to me, the reason why I've not sent somebody is because you do not have any self-control. Oh. Guys, if, if I could just be swallowed in my seat, I, I, I even wish. <laughs> so what I'm saying there is that sometimes you want something, but the Lord's not giving it to you because there's something you have to do for yourself first. Something needs to change in order to maintain this thing that you want. And the second thing to talk about is that this thing that you want cannot remain an idol to you. Many of us want something that we end up making it fixate, a fixation. And the thing with God is that God is not going to compete. It, the, fact, the fact that God loves you, he's not even going to try to compete. He just won't give it to you. He won't give it to you. And it's because he wants you to fix your gaze back on him and not just this item. Because the thing is that if you continue to only look at the item... It comes across that you're serving him just for it to come to pass. What happens afterwards? Remember, we serve a God that knows the beginning and the end. He knows what will happen if he gives this to you, so he's not going to give it. So 
for some of us is that we may have to just take our gaze away from the thing that we want, the thing that the Lord has promised, and place ourselves back in a, in, in a place where we can now just focus on him. Um, yeah, so I touched on this briefly as well. The third thing, continuing to seek the Lord despite not having what you are waiting for. So we saw earlier on that David waited, what, 15 years to be able to now step into his kingship. But he continued to serve the Lord in every other aspect of his call. The thing is that if we decide to neglect that because we're waiting for that one thing we want, we end up limiting ourselves. And again, the Lord will not grant this desire because it seems as if you're only serving him for it to come to pass. So we said it earlier, Seek first, the, seek first the kingdom of God and all of its righteousness and what? Perfect. Third, fourth thing is that whilst you're waiting, you don't want to compare yourself to someone that has what you want. And the reason I say that is because the issue with comparison is that nine times out of ten, that person you're comparing yourself to, they have something that you have. They want something, sorry, that you have. And you don't even know this. So um, what I want to talk about here is that with the thing, of, the thing of comparison is that if it's undealt with, you end up forming the spirit of rejection in yourself, right? Um, if we go to Genesis 29, 31, the story of Rachel and Leah, right? So it says in 29, 31, now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved and he opened her womb, but Rachel was unable to have children. So Rachel compares herself to her sister because her sister has children. Leah compares herself to Rachel because Rachel has the love of the husband. And the thing is that you see the, the spirit of rejection manifest through Leah's life, where it even goes as far as all of the children that she's having, but the last one, uh, their names are all birthed out of this rejection, wow. right? It was only the last one, Judah, when she says, but now I will praise the Lord, that finally she, she got it. She finally understood that you, <coughs> it has to come through God. It can't come from this place of pain and rejection, right? So, and the thing that's interesting about it as well is that the thing of the spirit of rejection is that you will cling on to that thing that you're good at, thinking that if I continue doing this, people will love me. If I continue doing this, people will think about me. If I continue doing this, I will be great. But the problem with that is that it doesn't matter what these people think. What the most important thing is how the Lord, is, is, is how the Lord sees you and how the Lord cares about you and what he thinks about you, what his thoughts are concerning you. So this is why in your weight, you can't start comparing yourselves, looking at someone, so-and-so's got this, so-and-so's got that, I should be at this point. No, you have to wait upon the Lord because you don't even know why they went on the path that they went on to even get there. If you knew even their story, you might even run away from it. So, and <laughs> the last thing I'm going to touch on is that you don't want to use shortcuts to try and get the thing you're waiting for. So in regards to a shortcut, if you decide to take everything into your own hands and not trust that of the Lord, again, because the Lord loves you, he will block it because he's not going to compete. So Genesis 30, 14 to 17, again, we're back with the story of Rachel and Leah. Like we said earlier, Rachel wants kids and, um, what happens is, is that Reuben, I'm just going to paraphrase it because uh, I'm running out of time. But um, <laughs> Rachel wants kids, right? And Reuben, who is the son of Leah, goes out into the fields and he gets this plant, which is called a mandrake. And the thing of this plant, the mandrake, it was used back in that time as something which would boost up your fertility, something of which would allow you to conceive. So Rachel makes a trade with Leah saying, if you give me these mandrakes, I will let you sleep with our husband tonight, right? So Rachel has these mandrakes and Leah, just, Leah is able to sleep with the husband. The same Leah that the Lord had temporarily closed her womb, it says that the Lord listened to her and she became pregnant. This Rachel that had this fertility boosting drug did not become pregnant. What am I saying to you? 
If you try to take a shortcut and the Lord loves you, he will block it. And it's because imagine if she became pregnant after taking this thing. Would she not give it more glory than that of the Lord? Would she trust in the Lord's timing? No. She would say, me, I've, I've even been able to create what I wanted for myself. I will trust in my own power. And the problem is, is that God is a very jealous God. He has to get glory in all things. So again, because he loves her, he will block it. Because he does not want to now allow her to even have the chance to not have this intimacy with him. And later on, what we see is that she finally has children. And the weight made sense because the child that she birthed was Joseph. The other child was Benjamin. And throughout scripture, you see the weight that these two carried. So one of the things I want to touch on as well, probably the last thing I'll talk about before we go into prayer, is that the thing of a shortcut, people take many different means. She tried to go through a drug, right? Some people, they will even go even further and they will now even go into witchcraft to get what they want. And the thing that's interesting about that is that the enemy cannot create anything. If you go to the enemy trying to shortcut something that the Lord has decided to stop, do you know what he will do? He will just exchange the problem. You will now go saying that I can't have children. Give me something so I can have a child. He will say, no problem, here's the child. But he won't tell you the terms and conditions that if I give you this child, you're going to be poor. <laughs> you'll now go and say, I want a job. But he will not tell you the terms and conditions that I'll give you the job, but your family, they're not going to progress. And it forms this reliance having to go back to this source outside of God to try and get something. But you end up moving further and further away because this thing has limited power. It is not God. And it's only till you get to the point of deliverance that finally, just finally, you get it the way the Lord wanted. So, in summary, we've spoken about waiting upon the call of the Lord, and we've spoken about waiting for our heart's desire. The one thing that seems with both of these is that we just have to wait and trust in the Lord. Because the Lord's timing is perfect. The Lord's timing is perfect because it's that of which will build up our character and develop us to be able to handle what comes with that of which we're waiting for. So um, I think I want us to stand up. We're going to go into a time of prayer. Amen. Um, musicians, if you can kindly come back. Thank you. But even before they come back, let's just first focus our attention and just, just worship God. Let there be an atmosphere of worship just from our voices. So let's just focus on him. Amen. And let's just raise up worship to him. Heavenly Father, we honor you. Heavenly Father, we honor you. We adore you. Hmm. We glorify your name, O oh God, and we say that you are good. <laughs> Elkanah, you are good. Covenant keeping God, you are good. <laughs> God, you are faithful. God, you are faithful. Dad, we thank you and we honor you. Keti karaba seki aramandoro yaderaka. Rebebebe yi kati abramasi kere arabaka. God, we honor you and we fix our gaze upon you. We give you the fruit of our lips, which is worship. We give you the fruit of our lips, which is our praise. We give you the fruit of our lips, O oh God. Ah, harabase ke ya kasete ya katarara, which is obedience to you. Did you not say, oh God, it's better to obey than to sacrifice? <laughs> that we fix our gaze upon you. Okay, the first thing we're going to pray into church is, we're first going to repent, right? We're going to repent where we've tried to take things into our own hands instead of waiting for the Lord. Um, this could be that maybe you've tried to bypass the, God, the Lord's timing. It could be that you've now gone into a, a place where you don't trust him anymore. But we're just going to use this moment just to pour out before him and just say, God, we're sorry. So let's go into that first. Amen. Let's just focus on him and just repent for where we've fallen short. Amen. Daddy was sorry. Daddy was sorry. Daddy was sorry. 
Daddy was sorry. Dad, it says that many will trust in horses and chariots, but we will trust in the name of our God. And Lord, we're sorry where we've trusted in the things of the world, the world of which are futile. Things of which vanish, oh God, and things of which, oh God, you say is just like a breath. We pray, Heavenly King of Glory, that as we fix our gaze to you today, oh God, we will remember who you are. As we fix our gaze and we wait upon your timing, oh God, we will remember that your timing is good, oh God, and your ways are perfect. <laughs> that we pour our heart before your altar today, oh God, and we say, that he transform it. Daddy, where we may have lost trust, we place our trust back in you. You said you are our strong tower. You said, Heavenly King of Glory, you are our anchor. You said you are our shield. You said you are our shield. You said you are our shield. You are our strong tower. You are the one that we rest in. You are our resting place. Rebecca Sikata, Daddy, we come back to this place, oh God. We come back to this place, oh God, that we may be able to trust you again. Understanding, Heavenly King of Glory, that you hold the affairs of our heart. <laughs> Are you not the one that you formed us? Daddy, we come back to a place of worship. Let our lives be that of a worship unto you. <laughs> Let our lives be that of which testify of your goodness. Daddy was sorry. Daddy was sorry. Daddy, we repent, oh God, in the times when the promise seemed to be greater than you. <laughs> Daddy, we take it back and we give it to you like an offering, like Hannah. <laughs> Rebea kisikiti ya rabato kotoreke aha. Rebababa ye kisikiti ya rabaka se katata. Daddy, we're sorry. Rebea kusuturu ya keseke ya kasikati kata. Rebea kisikiti ya rabaya tusoto. Thank you, Jesus. And the second thing we're going to pray for is against. <laughs> We're going to pray against the spirit of rejection. Like we spoke about, the spirit of rejection can come from a place of comparison. And it's not the Lord's will for us to harbor this spirit. So we're going to pray that the Lord may set us free where this may have entered us. Where in our waiting for the Lord, we've allowed it to even have the audacity to try to control our lives. So let's just, let's just pray now against the spirit of rejection where it may be seen in our lives. Amen. Heavenly Father, we honor you. Dad, you've not given us the spirit of rejection. <laughs> Robosu turu kase ya kasi ya la bata ta rea ki ya la bata sa ta 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 roboku su turu kasi katara la basa la basa ya kusu turu daddy let the chains break oh god where this has had the audacity to trouble your children ya ya basa ta robosu turu ka out in the name of Jesus we pray heavenly King of Glory that where this may trouble your children oh god where it may make them question what you've said about them where it may make them question oh God how they see you we pray heavenly father that it breaks off them now in the name of Jesus that they will walk and stand oh God as your children did you not say that you've not given them the spirit of fear but of power love and a sound mind that we pray soundness of mind over your children Daddy, did you not say that deliverance is your children's bread? We pray, Heavenly King of Glory, that as we come before you, O oh God, today, that your children will walk out, O oh God, in freedom. Did you not promise them freedom? Did you not promise them freedom? 
Rabato Soturu Rakasata, Rebea Kusuturia Kea Kasata, Rababaki Kasi Ekeke, Ye Katara Basti Katoro Robosto Tururuba Kasata, Rebei Katata Tata Rababa. That he give them a new heart. <laughs> That he give them a new heart. <laughs> Let trust be restored in their heart, oh God, where rejection has had the audacity to take its place. <laughs> Let them remember you, oh God, as their king. Let them remember you, oh God, as their God. Let them remember you, oh God, that if you say a thing, it will come to pass. Rebakustuturegeya <laughs> kasa. Daddy, bring back remembrance in your children. Ah ha ha. Rebakasite ya kasuturu bakase. Rebaba bakustuturere ha ha. Rebeya kustuture katikatarara. Rebeya kustuturu kasata. Bring back remembrance in your children, oh God. Katiketi Arabaki Sete Akosuturu Rabati Sataradada Rebebe Akasikati Katanada Tata. Deliver your children, O God. Let them remember that you are theirs and they are yours. No more. No more. Makateke Akasuturu. The next thing we're going to do, we're going to travel, right? We saw that Hannah, in her travel, that the Lord granted her her petition, where all this is, is that we're going to push and allow the Holy Spirit to do the rest. So that thing that you're waiting for, now's that moment that if you just push, if you just allow the Holy Spirit to birth it out of you, may the heavens open up for your sake. So we're just gonna use this moment to continue to push. Think about that thing that you want, that thing that the Lord has called you to, that business, that financial blessing that you're waiting for. Now's that moment to travel and push in him. So don't look at me, fix your gaze on him and just push, 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 push. Mm. Push, 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 push. Rebaka seki arabaki seke ya kasuto. Ha ha, ha ha ha, ha ha ha. Ha 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 ha. Rebaba ba ha ha. Ha 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 ha. Rebaba ba ya kusuto ro 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 ha ha. Yeah. 
Travailing, continue to push, allow the Lord to push through you. But one of the things that the Lord put on my heart when I was preparing my notes, I thought that there's some people in here that cannot speak in tongues. Now is the moment to come forward. If this is a gift that you want from the Lord, it says in scripture to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Do not be ashamed, come forward. For some of you, it may be that the Lord will just place upon you a new tongues. But come forward, don't be ashamed. So now is the atmosphere to get it. Amen. So I said, just come forward if you want to be able to speak in tongues. Hallelujah. Robo, 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 robo,